Not too long ago, the term platformer was synonymous with an expectation of a certain level of graphical quality. Well, long gone are those days, and a game like Fist Forged in Shadow Torch shows that off in spades, wielding graphical fidelity and visual features that rival those put into massive AAA games. In today's video brought to you by Fist Forged in Shadow Torch, I will explore the visuals behind this punky Metroidvania game, discussing how Unreal Engine 4 here is leveraged to bring this world to life, how its set of ultra high-end features like ray tracing enable an extra layer of fidelity on an already handsome package, and how DLSS enables high-end experiences even on low-end hardware. But enough of my jabbering and dadling, let's hop to it and drill down into the rendering and visuals of Fist Forged in Shadow Torch. Before I get into the main body of this video, I really want to describe exactly what type of game we're looking at here, which will then frame the technical aspects. Fist, as I will call it for short, is a Metroidvania style game. That means you're engaging in side-scrolling platforming, filled with double jumps, wall jumps, wall slides, dashing, and more across an ever-widening and interconnected level. This happens while engaging with enemies of a variety of archetypes, various bosses, and physical obstacles and puzzles. Obstacles in this game are generally overcome by deft platforming and or by utilizing a power-up which is attached to the weapons that your character wields, including the titular weapon of choice in this game. With your mechanical fist, you can unlock a move which does heavy horizontal damage to enemies on charge up, or it can be used to open up specific doors in a horizontal direction, thus unlocking new areas of the map to progress into, or other kind of hidden areas while backtracking through the game to gain more resources to cash in at upgrade stations to increase your Set. As the game widens up, you also gain access to a town filled with NPCs that you can interact with, where you can stock up for missions ahead, or you can just let it be a place of respite in between the hardcore platforming and combat where you just sit back and listen to some music. So with this description of the game, given this gameplay type and genre, one of the first things that actually caught my eye here is the lavish level of detail that I don't think is too common. Many areas you pass through are almost constructed like the hyper detailed backgrounds found in fighting game stages, or the background 2D artwork you might have seen in a mid 90s JRPG on the PlayStation 1. Except here, it is of course all in 3D, and it's replete with secondary motion and depth mixing in with effects work to help sell the mood. This level of detail seems rather high for the genre from my perspective, as in Metroidvania games you can translate through areas or screens, maybe as you may call them, at the speed of a jackrabbit if you really want to. As an example, take a look at this noodle bar here in the game's town and the area surrounding it. It has all these little flourishes like the flashing broken sign, the snaking pipes on the left hand side, or the misaligned stools and scattered pots and pans across the counter. All those assets in detail for an area that you can just blast right on by, or that when you want to spend a little bit more time there, you can get a shield power up for your protection before you venture out into the main gameplay world on a mission. Here the developers at TI Games have spent the time and effort to make sure even this mundane area with a small mechanic contributes to world building through its lavish attention to detail. A similar approach to the world is maintained actually on the characters here as well, both on friendly NPCs like your bear friend here, or the various enemy types that you encounter across the game, of which there are quite many enemy types. Each one of these models on close inspection is just brimming with detail and a variety of different material types, like the enemy robotic soldiers in the game, which take full advantage of Unreal Engine's physically based material pipeline, showing off dull clothing materials, mixing over heavily polished metals with worn edges and scratched surfaces. The main character though is probably the most interesting, technically, as we see a mixing of hard surface modeling from the metal on his robotic arm, as well as organic materials like 
the fur, which takes advantage of subsurface scattering so that the light hitting the one side of the fur, for example on his ears, shines through to the other side, making it look wispy and thin. Now you may think this detail is decadent, considering that the character is more often than not just occupying a small, multiple hundred pixel box on the screen, but the game switches the camera angle actually rather often during the gameplay itself and based upon the platforming needs of the area, so the camera can end up quite close. And similarly, the game does seem to use this model for cinematic sequences, which brings the camera up even closer where any blemishes might stick out, so that attention to detail there is actually not completely unwarranted. Now keeping up this detail throughout the world like they really have here in Fist Forge and Shadow Torch is not easy, but there's another challenge attached with a world like this as well. With a world of this size and this type of gameplay, the developer needs to make sure that areas look visually distinct and visually memorable, being able to be discerned from one another in the player's memory at a moment's notice. This is landmarking as I will call it, and it's important to a game like this where you end up backtracking through the world often to unlock new areas or go back and use a power up in an area you've previously been in. Sure you have a map of course, but that can only get you so far in remembering exactly where something may be. You need other clues. For example, you as a player need to backtrack at one moment in the game to an NPC in a prison cell to free them after you find a key to that cell nearly 30 minutes later after dozens of platforming and combat areas. So how does a player actually remember that one area that they need to backtrack to? Here that visual lavish attention to detail that I've described in this game has an interesting gameplay effect. For example, instead of each corridor connecting larger platforming areas looking all very similar, each one has different lighting arrangements, different light temperature, different material types, and so on and so forth. There's a twofold effect going on here with this level of detail. First, the world looks more diverse and interesting as there's less visual repetition, but at the same time each area in the game that you pass through can be more easily committed to memory due to their visually distinct nature. It's not just a set of samey corridors. A big part of this visual distinction here is often just primarily down to lighting actually, as there is realistically a limited amount of models and assets a game can have in any one area due to art, time, and budget. And driving that lighting here is a heavy reliance on Unreal Engine's baked lighting with some dynamic elements as well. For example, in the forward part of a frame, most of the lighting tends to be done with dynamic lights so that characters and effects and dynamic shadows are present. But in the background, a lot of the lighting actually tends to be done via static means, presumably to increase performance, which I'll get to later in the video. As a result of this usage of baked lighting, the game's inclusion of ray tracing fulfills a different and less transformative role than we've seen in other games that utilize ray tracing. In Fist Forged and Shadow Torch, ray tracing is complementary to the visuals in the game, which are already quite good, and it fixes them up and makes them even more polished. Take for example one of the first areas in the game you start in, in the old town. Without ray tracing effects being on, it's good looking for sure where screen space reflections are there and there's a mix of baked and dynamic lights. Add in ray tracing and we see an enhanced image. First you have all the surfaces in the game bouncing light off them now due to the RTGI. So areas outside of direct lighting are now bathed in an orange yellow glow instead of being starkly and coldly lit and gray in shadow. Furthermore you have screen space reflections swapped out for ray traced reflections. So this kind of glowing green look one sees in those areas where screen space reflections don't work so well, well that goes away. In the end with ray tracing on, you have all the individual and disparate assets and models of the scene essentially gelling better, where reflective surfaces are related to one another and rougher surfaces are related to one another thanks to ray trace global illumination. A similar effect can be seen in this scene here where GI lights up those shadows areas to become less gray and have a more warm tone from the street below and reflections look less awkward as they do not fall back to that greenish generic Q map in those areas where SSR does not work so well. Beyond this increased image cohesion, the ray tracing on its high setting also adds in two other visible effects. Firstly, neon signage or any emissive texture now contributes to global lighting. So here without ray trace GI on, we can see a normal looking neon sign like you would see in any video game. And with GI turned on, you can see how its surface now emits red light that 
adds to the lighting of the areas nearby. Another effect added in with the highest ray tracing setting on are ray trace guided water caustics. Like you can see here in this scene where there's a very dynamic high fidelity splash of light on the wall coming from the water when RT is on. This effect is rather neat as real time caustics are actually extremely rare in video games, even in AAA ones. And being real time and ray traced means the caustic light dances around with each of your character movements. It's really quite neat. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, with the proper settings, it's quite simple to make this game run quite well at 4K on low-end ray tracing hardware. Firstly, the smart thing to do is to turn down ray tracing to low. This will cull RTGI and caustics, keeping ray trace reflections, but saving valuable frame time on a GPU like an RTX 2060. Then activate DLSS. In this game, it uses an auto setting that scales based upon output resolution. Auto here is setting the game to performance mode. This can more than double the frame rate on a GPU like this one at this resolution, putting it into the 60 FPS realm. The largest differences in image quality will be found on the ray traced reflections or thin transparent objects like hair, where DLSS does a good job, but not as good as a job as native. With settings like these, the RTX 2060, one of the lowest end ray tracing GPUs on desktop, can do an excellent 60 FPS in most combat scenarios and platforming sections, with only really the boss fights giving this GPU a hard time bringing it below 60 FPS, but not by much. Similarly, at these settings, the RTX 2060 can do 1080p 120 quite well actually, and given the chance, this would be my preferred way to play this game on this this GPU. But be mindful as your CPU becomes much more important when targeting 120 FPS in this game. And more mid range CPUs like an Ryzen 3600 will struggle to keep 120 FPS in busy areas in the game, like the town for example. There are some other things you should watch out for in this game before you start it. Firstly, transitioning rooms in the game can but will not always induce a frame time dip as new assets are loaded in on the fly. To minimize this as much as possible, Possible, definitely install the game to an SSD. Secondly, make sure you force anisotropic filtering in your graphics control panel, as the game by default only has around 4 times AF, and the camera angle in this game makes it rather obvious. Beyond that though, try and have a bit of fun if you can. As important as the technical aspects of this game are, the actual meat of the game is the gameplay itself, which I think will impress. And with that being said, we are at the end of this video, and if you did enjoy it, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're already a subscriber, hit that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to help us out? Support DF on Patreon to get years worth of our content in high quality for download, and also join us on our Discord server for behind the scenes shenanigans and much more. If you want to talk to me about Fist Forged in Shadow Torch on PC, write a comment below or follow me and DF on Twitter. And as always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell and auf Wiedersehen!